see damage. I think we try all four treatments to get started. Well, blue correlates so strongly with the, the absence of carb. Do they eat their eggs? Yes, they do eat their eggs. The question now is do they eat enough? And this is the experiment for this year. Although carp have three million eggs, they're, they're also their Achilles heel because they're so vulnerable. They're just tiny, clear things that are totally defenseless. So if there is a good game fish community, it seems they can come along and just vacuum it up. Last summer, we did diet sampling. We found that I think it was like 95% of the fish that were eating carp eggs were bluegill sunfish. But really all we've looked at is eggs so far. So we still have to look at larvae, which should open it up. We're going to build essentially fish enclosures and so we'll be able to stock these enclosures with certain fish. So essentially we'll be testing what fish communities will be able to control carp recruitment. And so far it looks like in big lake systems, um, carp really aren't um, all that successful. And that may be because there's a high population of bluegill sunfish. Peter's research team has found that there's a lot of carp reproduction taking place in these small lake systems and these fish may actually move down into the main chain of lakes. These movements through waterways are quite systematic. What they're doing is they're looking for areas to have their young and they're particularly looking for areas that are devoid of native fishes uh, because if they have their young in these areas that are devoid of native fishes and often these are areas that uh, have experienced severe winter kills severe winters, uh, then their young have a chance of surviving because they won't get eaten. And they're kind of outsmarting all the native fish in this respect. We may be looking at stocking those systems with bluegill sunfish. And so if we can manage that, then we can probably manage the number of new carp that are getting into the system. If you're going to remove the young, uh, then, it may, then you should also prevent new adults from moving in. So yes, barriers in targeted ways. And then if we can somehow address the population of the carp that we already have and reduce that number, then we should be able to get carp under control. My name is Jordan Wine. I'm a carp intern for the Ramsey-Washington Watershed District. We have to barricade some, some areas to keep them from moving from certain places to another. When it gets to that point in their, in their development, when they know it's time to move somewhere else, uh, it's really tough to stop them from getting there. And they, they seem to find ways to do it. Everybody likes the clear lakes, the, the large bass, you know, the fish that they like to fish, and uh, carp can really have a strong influence on this. One reason we have so many is because, frankly, they're pretty crafty. It's not that they're stupid or anything, far from it. They do some really interesting things that are quite surprisingly sophisticated. Just had to look. <laughs> you can, for instance, uh, teach a carp to learn a maze, and not only will it learn it, and it will learn the pattern of right versus left turns, the, you know, that's a certain level of cognition, really. Uh, they will remember that certainly for many months. They have an exquisitely developed taste system and sensory system in their mouths which allows them to feed in the bottom in ways that no native fish can. So they're continually turning lakes upside down. They're pumping nutrients and sediments out and digging plants up. They turn the ecosystem inside out. I mean, that's what it amounts to and everything goes along with it. My name is Ahankyo Lim. I'm working as a postdoc here and my expertise in the here is identifying and developing female and male carp sex pheromones from which we can develop a potent carp attractants. I'm a trained entomologist. Yeah, my PhD is a moth pheromone. Dr. Sorensen actually hired me to uh, kind of apply my previous experience on moth, actually moth pheromone, to this new system. Using the infrared light and a CCTV camera, which feeds a real, um, real time footage to the TV monitor. So we just observe the TV monitor to actually see how they behave. We try to understand which specific test order is attractive or neutral or uh, repelling. So there are the four pearl fish are hanging here and this now that this size it has some pheromone stuff. They I, they seem to be seems to have already detected. This is kind of a sign of their uh, interest. So do you ever get sick of carp? 
Yeah, especially when, uh, whenever they are not, uh, not behaving that, uh, the way that I expected. <laughs> yeah. I've been working on this car for three and a half years, but um, always interesting, honestly. Electrofishing is a technique that creates an electric field in the water that actually stuns fish. And so when we want uh, a certain sex or a certain size of a fish, uh, we can pick and choose which one we want because it brings just about everything that's within that field up to the surface and able to be caught. So we're, we're hunting for one good fish and they're easy to miss. Sage Passy. I work for Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District as a school and community-based project coordinator. The goal of the watershed is to engage people in working together to improve water quality and helping everybody see how their role makes a difference. With students these days, we're really trying to create a literacy about observation. We started out by sitting down with the scientists and asking them what they thought kids would be excited about what they're doing and they started to help translate some of their very technical processes into a language that kids could understand. When the alien fish, like carp, come in, they can move faster than the other native fish. So they're able to get in there before the other native fish can, and then they kind of just take it over, because they're the first ones in, and they're like a big bully. And they can actually dig down into the mud almost a foot. So if you go down this deep into the mud, trying to pull out all those little worms. What was cool about working on the CARP project with students in the East Metro area was that now they have a new identity. CARP are much more than they thought they were. They didn't realize how powerful they were in terms of affecting an ecosystem. A lot of people thought really nothing could be done about CARP. Um, and that they wouldn't be very interesting and glad to say that hasn't proven to be the case. There's the potential of doing large-scale carp removal, uh, which research has shown that this could uh, significantly benefit water quality in the Phelan chain. So really that's our, our ultimate goal is to improve water quality in the chain. So we're not after extermination, we're after controlling them to a reasonable, sustainable level that people can afford that'll make a difference. When you're involved with the Watershed District, you know that you're really one big community. It's not one city fighting another city, it's everybody trying to work in concert to solve everybody's problem. The science has been great. I mean, we've learned a tremendous amount and uh, we're getting some really new and interesting data on the biology and ecology of an invasive fish. My cohorts, other professionals, kind of are envious of the project and really can't wait to see the data come out. And um, I'm really glad that we had an opportunity to perform this work in the Phelan Chain of Lakes. Mm -hmm.